Uh, good morning to everyone. <clears throat> uh, thank you, SLMA, uh, for this privileged opportunity given to me uh, in front of these, uh, I would say, the, the elite and the experts in the fields of diving uh, at the book launching of uh, uh, SLMA guidelines on management of decompression sickness. So before starting my presentation, I would like to tell you why this uh, word mysteries in the topic of my presentation. So as you all know, uh, that we have more detailed knowledge about the moon uh, compared to the knowledge we have about the depths of the oceans. It is because that uh, it is uh, challenging and uh, it's a difficult task for the explore uh, for uh, to explore the depths of the oceans due to the extreme pressures and the limited visibility so which has made it uh, difficult to study and has uh, made it uh, difficult to understand fully so similar to that the illnesses related to diving such as decompression sickness vary uh, between individual to individual uh, due to the factors like different um, diving uh, profiles, different uh, ascent rates, and even different uh, individual physiology. So treatment can be complex and um, uh, I would say a bit tricky and um, challenging for the diving physicians uh, due to this. Um, I would say the controversies of uh, the patients uh, who present to us. So, uh, I will first give you a, a scope of diving related illnesses. So, if you look at this, uh, now it's not only the decompression sickness, but also if you see the number one, it is. Uh, illnesses due to different concentration of respired gases. That means divers do dive with uh, compressed air uh, cylinders. And uh, as you all know, uh, the atmospheric pressure around you is, if you take it as one uh, at atmospheric absolute, you know, we have oxygen percentage of 21% and nitrogen in 79. So at an atmospheric pressure of 180A, the oxygen partial pressure would be 0.21 and nitrogen partial pressure would be 0.79 according to the Dalton's law. Uh, I, I hope you all know. So it is okay to respire these gases in these partial pressures because uh, I mean, like there will be no issue on respiring 0.79 of partial pressure of nitrogen on the atmospheric pressure. But when you dive into the depths, what happens is the atmospheric pressure around you increases. So which has a direct uh, relation to the partial pressures of the gases in your gas cylinder. So you will be fine on respiring 0.79 partial pressure of nitrogen on the surface, but at the depths, it will be increased to the levels of toxic. I mean, uh, you may have heard the term nitrogen narcosis. So, likewise, even oxygen at the surface, at a partial pressure of 0.21, you are fine. But at the depths, you can get oxygen toxicity. And the second one, injury is caused directly by the change of pressure. So, you know, it is about the barotraumas. So uh, when a diver dives into the depths, you know, uh, every 10 meter, your pressure doubles. I mean, at the surface, if you think your pressure is 180A, at 10 meters, it will be 280A. And at 20 meters, it will be triple, th uh, uh, 380A, likewise. So there's a huge change of uh, pressure uh, when you are diving. So 
take take an instance now your lung capacity at the surface is uh, 6 liters right and at the 10 meters it will be 3 liter 3 liters so you see the change of uh, what the change of pressure can do to your uh, hollow organs inside your body lungs um, your sinuses your middle ear likewise so that the change of pressure uh, can break the integrity of the walls of those hollow organs and make you uh, problems right so the third one decompression sickness which i will be elaborating in my presentation and also you can see there are injuries due to hazardous marine animals there are marine animals who who bites uh, who pricks and who make uh, i mean who poison you with bites and also there will be marine animals who will be in contact with you and uh, give you symptoms of maybe anaphylactic shock so finally there are other mechanical injuries due to temperature you know you can get hypothermic inside water and also there will be <coughs> patients with comorbidities previous medical illnesses so who should be cautious in diving so that's why we are screening uh, all the divers in uh, sri lanka navy before <coughs> they start to dive so this is a case scenario which we encountered uh, one year back which when i was working at the recompression facility at the naval dockyard so this patient was a uh, recreational diver so he didn't have much knowledge about the uh, diving practices so he presented with uh, he was a previous healthy patient actually uh, he presented with left lower limb numbness weakness and urinary retention following three repetitive sea dives so he has dived in in this day during these hours and he had the onset of symptoms were three hours after surfacing from the last dive right so the problem one of the problems if you can see he has reached naval hospital eastern command 19 hours after the onset of symptoms so there was a big lapse before he reaching the reaching our chamber facility so as uh, our command of navy told you we should minimize this time lapse from the occurrence of symptoms to start of treatment we we, uh, we should minimize this time so on examination he had uh, left knee joint and his ankle joint power was about 3 by 5 and he had patchy sensory reduction in left lower limb and there was <coughs> diminished re reflexes of knee joint and ankle joint and he was his bladder was palpable because he had uh, urinary retention so this was his dive in profile so his first dive was Uh, a thirty-minute dive, which he went to the maximum depth of eighty feet sea water, and uh, he has come up without any decompression stops. Uh, to this dive, actually, we don't need decompression stops if you see the diving tables. But then the repetitive, uh, the second dive, he had done a dive of hundred feet sea water uh, with a bottom time of thirty-five minutes. So, which needed a decompression stop, but he had. not done it because of his lack of knowledge so so he had after the second dive he had felt some symptoms of decompression sy symptoms sickness and what he have done is has done is he has done a uh, in water decompression which uh, uh, is a dangerous thing as <coughs> uh, we to told you before so he, this recom in water decompression was also not uh, done properly so that's why the patient came came with this uh, symptoms remember in this uh, case scenario we will see uh, well now when a diver descends down uh, to the water what happens is as i told you the ambient pressure around the diver increase gradually increase with the depth so when the ambient pressure around you increases the partial pressures of each gases inside your cylinder increases so what happens is when the partial pressure of the nitrogen oxygen 
increases inside your cylinder it dissolves more in your tissues because there is a pressure gradient from your alveoli to your blood and to your soft tissue so due to that pressure gradient increasing due to that increase in pressure gradient there will be nitrogen uh, dissolving uh, more in your soft tissues up to a level of super saturation now the oxygen what happens is even though oxygen was uh, oxygen is dissolved more oxygen is used in i mean utilized in metabolism but nitrogen is an inert gas as you all know so it get accumulated in your soft tissues it dissolves until it comes to an equilibrium so that is explained by this henry's law so if you see this henry's law it says that at a constant temperature uh, greater the partial pressure of a gas greater the amount of that gas will be dissolved in solution so that's why the nitrogen uh, dissolved in the tissue uh, in an amount uh, <clears throat> more than at the surface so what happened in ascending when the diver ascends the ambient pressure around you Uh, gradually reduces so there will be a negative gradient from your soft tissues to your blood to your alveoli so that negative gradient should uh, put nitrogen out from your soft tissues out from your uh, lungs but the problem is this needs time so uh, th- the time is a very important fact in this so if you do not let if you do not permit time for this nitrogen to come out from your body so you can get nitrogen bubbles right so ascending in a correct way doesn't make any problem but a rapid ascent will make problem because in a rapid ascent what happens is you don't give time for this nitrogen to come out from your body so the nitrogen changes from its dissolved form into a gaseous form inside your tissues so that's how the nitrogen bubbles are formed <clears throat> so how this boil slow come here is now you say you have uh, done a dive to 100 meters and you have ascended to 50 meters uh, rapidly so they have uh, take that uh, instant take an instance where the bubbles were formed inside your coronary arteries so the bubble is now uh, the diameter of the bubble is half of the diameter of your coronary artery so it's now partially occluding the artery now what happens is when you ascend more with that bubble according to the boil slow boil slow it says that when the pressure around you reduces this uh, the volume of air increase so when you coming up the volume of the bubble increases and at the surface it will be uh, big enough to occlude the whole coronary artery so you will get uh, probably if it was in the left anterior descending artery you will get a massive uh, myocardial infarction so likewise <clears throat> so now decompression sickness is it occurs when dissolved nitrogen moves out of solution and forms bubbles in body tissues and fluids so it results from ascending to the surface too rapidly following a deep prolonged dive so that's what i explained to you before and this can actually happen from a minimum ascent from 25 feet sea water so the decompression sickness is also known as case on disease disparism compressed air sickness bends diverse paralysis and uh, caisson's disease caisson disease the name came from this uh, uh the structure the people used to work in the past uh, inside the water so the pressure of air inside it which kept water out of it so the people who worked down there when they came up they had the symptoms of uh, the compression sickness so this name bends the name bends how this name bends came to uh, uses uh, when the uh, 
when these patients had the pains of their joints what they did was they try to keep them bent to reduce the pain so that's how the name bends has come so how to avoid this decompression sickness so there are diving tables you can follow to prevent the decompression sickness and these uh, diving tables have developed through decades of research and development and they have been <clears throat> using this gas content model bubble model and there were ratios in between them to create this model what in sri lanka what we follow is the uh, <clears throat> american uh, diving tables uh, for to do the dives and to treat the uh, decompression sickness so if you can see this chart the dives you do to the left side of this red line you know you don't have to do the decompressions Uh, take an instance if you take this dive in depth of 40 feet if you do a diving for about 20 minutes if you see for a dive of uh, that depth for 20 minutes you don't need to stop uh, when you are ascending from the dive so you do not have to do decompression sorry decompression dives so the dives to the right of this chart you will have to do the decompression stops according to diving tables this is a, an example of a no decompression limit uh, chart if you can only concentrate on, on the uh, leftmost two columns you can see if you take a 50 feet sea water dive you can see the no stop limit is 92 minutes so if you don't uh, stay for 92 minutes in a 50 feet sea water dive you can come up without any decompression so the people who are not experts in diving the recommendation is try to do the dives in no decompression limits so this is uh, an example of a diving table uh, So this is an example of a diving table which divers follow. If you look at the this diving table, it's a 80 feet sea water dive. So take an instance, you have done a 100 meter dive, and if you follow the chart, you can see that you have to stop at 30 feet sea water for one minute, and at 20 feet sea water for 147 minutes before coming up to the surface. you can see that you have to stop at 20 feet sea water for 147 minutes that is more than 2 hours right so what the stage decompression do is it requires the diver to make one or more stops on the ascent to surface as i told you you have to stop at different uh, depths so that dip what that stops do is it permits the time required for the slowest tissue compartment to lose sufficient nitrogen out from your body because nitrogen absorbance to your uh, different tissue is at different rate so you have to let the slowest tissue compartment to lose enough excess nitrogen uh, before you come up to the surface so that's why you stops at different depths so this is a surface stage decompression that means if there in any case if there is any issue of uh, decompression decompressing a, a diver uh, inside the water uh, you can use this if you have a chamber in the close vicinity you can quickly come up to the surface and get into the diving ch um, recompression chamber and do the uh, decompressions uh, with your own time i mean according to the diving tables so what happens if you don't do uh, adequate decompressions what happens here is the primary bubbles are forms in the venous and arterial vascular bed mostly it will be venous because the artery as you all know the arterial pressure is high so other bubbles form in central nervous tissue 
these bubbles can cause lesions in the brain and spinal cord. They will act like space occupy lesions. Also, the bubbles occur in also uh, in tendon sheath, subcutaneous tissue, and it could actually uh, occur in almost all the tissues. So the symptoms of decompression sickness usually appear within four to six hours, but it can appear from one hour to maybe 24 hours. You can get the symptoms of uh, decompression sickness following a dive. So the severe violation of decompression procedures initiate symptoms immediately. So these uh, symptoms can progress to paralysis within minutes. So the degree of injury depends on the size of the bubble and where it is from. So if you have bubbles in the musculoskeletal system, you get localized deep pain and joint pain. If the bubbles are in the lungs, you get shortness of breath, cough, hypoxemia. And if the bubbles are in the cerebrovascular system and coronary arteries, it will give rise to symptoms like coronary vascu uh, cerebrovascular accidents and a coronary artery disease. And bubbles in spinal cord and peripheral nerves, uh, you will get symptoms of lower motor and upper motor neur uh, neuron lesions. So these are some examples of bubbles in your, uh, histologically, these are some examples, the bubbles in your uh, gastrointestinal tract. The last one is omentum and the top one is the liver. So there are two types of decompression sickness. There is type one and type two mainly. So the type one is actually, we can say it has minor symptoms where you have poorly localized joint pain uh, and skin rash, this cutis marmorata is a pathognomic feature of DCS type 1, which actually uh, not that visible in uh, dark colored people. And you can get also itching, lymphatic swelling, and sometimes extreme fatigue. And in DCS type 2, which is the uh, critical uh, part of decompression sickness, you can get respiratory symptoms, cardiovascular symptoms, and the neurological symptoms. So the case scenario I was telling you about initially, so the management we did was we, uh, we did the recompression treatment started according to Sri Lanka Navy recompression protocol for decompression sickness, that is US Navy table. Six was selected depending on the depth and the clinical ground of this patient. Uh, and uh, six recompression treatments were conducted for this patient on USN table six and USN table five. So detailed description about uh, treatment of decompression sickness will be um, given to you by uh, Surgeon uh, Captain Ari Devasa. So this was the management we did. And the outcome was his biochemical and hematological parameters came to normal and his gait improved 90% and his left lower limb power uh, improved drastically. It was almost normal on discharge and his urinary retention improved partially. He could uh, mixture it with uh, uh, forceful urination, uh, but we reviewed him after six weeks and uh, then he, his urine output was normal. I mean, he could pass urine without any issue. Thank you. Thank you very much for lending me your good ears. Thank you. Thank you.